Hi, let's talk about functional aggression. Uh, this is a short one. I think it's important to understand aggression. Uh, in fact, I'm observing it right here. I don't know why Penelope is now chasing Lucy all the time. Uh, poor Lucy is getting upset about it. Uh, so, another demonstration of aggression. Aggression in cats has been interesting studies. They talk about temporospatial aggression as a function of cats. So we often think in terms of animals as dominance hierarchies, and that's how they sort them out, probably to facilitate breeding, right? And that's a, a functional aspect of aggression in, in animals. Uh, but it seems more complicated with cats than that. The, the dominance really depends on where they are and at what time it is as well. So uh, it's, it's not a simple, uh, a simple set of rules regarding this. And that leads to some pretty interesting observations. But I digress. Are you surprised? Let's talk functional aggression. It's not tied to any specific assignment. So if you want to shut this shit down right now... Uh, no, don't. But, but if you wanted to, uh, it's not tied directly to any specific paper. Okay. So aggression is defined as a behavior into causing harm, damage, pain, right? E either physical or mental against a target. The target can be living. It can be symbolic. So we can aggress towards a person or a group of people. We can also aggress towards a monument. And a little bit of that going on uh, right now here in 2020, right? Intention to harm is also a characteristic of aggressive behavior, although unintentional aggression has been suggested as well. Now, the problem of aggression, it's functional. It often accomplishes its goal. So if I aggress, right, if someone is giving me a bunch of bullshit, they're, they're talking smack, and I say, look, you can shut up or I'm going to punch your face, and they don't shut up, I punch their face, then they top, stop talking smack. Notice aggression worked. It was, in fact, functional. It accomplished its goal. I wanted to shut them up. They wouldn't shut up. I punched them in the face. They shut up. Boom. We be done. Uh, so... But violence has a relatively low base rate in society. I mean, we, we talk about violence, but imagine you were going to do a field study where you wanted to observe behavior on the Ohio State Oval. And you got up, let's say, in the bell tower of Orton Hall, right? And you hid yourself up there and get some headphones on for when the bell goes off. But you hide up there, and now you just observe people's behavior. And literally, you'll have thousands of people out on the oval, and you could categorize their behaviors. And you might observe eating behavior. You might observe studying behavior. You might observe some romantic behavior, some athletic play behavior, some dog walking behavior. All day long on the Oval, do you think it's conceivable you could go the whole day watching the Oval, literally thousands of people, and not observe one violent incident, one aggressive incident? And that's quite possible. So studying aggression, especially in its natural environment, can be daunting because of the relatively low base rate. But its consequences often have tremendous uh, negative impact, so it forces us to study it because the consequences can be so severe. And historically, aggression was viewed in two ways. Instrumental, that is aggression to achieve a desired end. So I'm the bully at school, and I say, hey, give me your lunch money or I'm going to punch your face, right? What is that about? It's about getting your lunch money, right? I used aggression to achieve a gain. Right? Now, emotional aggression is often employed as its own sake, and this is a definition or a subcategory of aggression that came under assault by a lot of social scientists. Right? Emotional aggression has been replaced conceptually with reactive aggression. And this is then probably non-consciously generated or stimulated aggression. So this is habitual aggression that's activated stimulus response model. And that's why I thought that assignment we did about stimulus response is so important because it's so implicable to so much that we observe in our own lives and the lives of others. Hi, Penelope. Are we done chasing uh, Lucy now? I don't know why you're doing that, sweetie. It's not very nice. Right? But you're getting something out of it. I don't know what the hell she gets out of it. Do you feel tough? Yeah, you feel pretty awesome about yourself, don't you? All right. So is it a useful di dichotomy to, to separate aggression into these subsets? I don't know. Maybe it's better to think of aggression with or without anger, and a lot of theorists go with that. You think about a, a hitman, right? If you're a good hitman, it's probably best not to get angry, but to remain cool, all right? You know? So leave the gun. Take the cannolis. That kind of level of cool uh, for instrumental aggression without anger. So... 
What do we know about aggression and disinhibiting aggression? What if you want to make people more aggressive? Or when should you be cautious that you might in turn become more aggressive when you don't necessarily want to? Well, alcohol facilitates aggression. Remember, alcohol uh, releases GABA into the prefrontal cortex, and this is where your, all your inhibitory process is. This is cost-benefit analysis. This is saying, man, I don't think that's a good idea, or man, I don't think that's very nice, or man, I don't want to go there. That's up here. You start drinking, this shit starts shutting down, and then we can become more aggressive. We don't necessarily have the level of restraint. Right, sweetie? So, anarchy. Man, when all bets are off, when, when, when law has been set aside, people can become more aggressive, right? Dehumanization. If we dehumanize, dehumanize a person or a group of people, then it allows others to become more aggressive towards them because, and, and the Nazis did this with the Jews, they likened the Jews to vermin, that is rats, you know, pestilent carrying creatures, and not human beings. So most of us, you know, would be willing to set out a rap trap or a mouse trap. And, and if you can reduce a group of people to the level of being perceived as a mouse or a rat, then it becomes easier to aggress towards them. Yeah. De-individuation, now this is on the aggressor. If we make the aggressor de-individuated, that is make them anonymous, make them hidden, then they're more likely to aggress. If we supply people with uh, justification for being aggressive, then in fact... Uh, they're more likely to become aggressive. Jack people up, get them aroused, right? And they they can become more aggressive. So learning aggression, right, has been studied by a huge number of people. And who do we have here? Well, let's let's can you can you tell me who's here? How good are you with your psychologist, right? Who who do we got there? Now, if you guess B.F. Skinner, nicely done. How about down here? That's going back a little ways. And I'll give you a hint. This guy wasn't even a psychologist. He was a physiologist studying digestion. Digestion and the, as facilitated by the saliva in dogs. Are we getting close now? That's Pavlov. Right? Okay, who do we have here? We've talked about this guy before. Albert Bandura, social learning theory. And then these two guys kind of partnered on, on something that we can talk about. We got Richard Nisbet, Dick Nisbet. University of Michigan, Champaign-Urbana, various places, and this was his graduate student, went on to develop an o his own career as a professor, Dove Cohen, right? So we know that classical and operant conditioning were the work of Pavlov, was classical conditioning, Skinner operant conditioning, right? Social learning theory was Bandura, blew the lid off of social psychology at that point in time. Really a great modification to, to operant conditioning. He said, you don't have to be rewarded directly. You can observe someone reward, uh, be rewarded for their aggression and then and imitate them. Remember the Bobo doll studies, etc. Okay. And then the, the socialization part. Now, Gerbner sa said male versus female aggression. Why do males aggress more than females or why do they aggress in different manners is largely a process of socialization in any given culture. But then other cultural, Do Dove Cohen, and un under the guidance of Richard Nisbet, looked at the Southern culture of honor to explain why Southern males were more likely to respond aggressively than Northern males within a laboratory paradigm. Right? And that was the culture of honor that in the South, people were taught you can't just let an insult go. You have to respond to it. Right? That there's pride. Uh, there's a lot of features involved. And now we look at gang uh, kind of philosophy that you have to be tough so they prize toughness and you can't let things go you have to respond you're forced to respond to insults right or or, or turf battles and then the media uh, influence aggression scripts right imagine that when the Dirty Harry movies came out Clint Eastwood right as the cop Harry Callahan Dirty Harry and he was noted in the movies for carrying a Smith & Wesson Model 29 6-inch 44 Magnum handgun. That movie was so popular, and the concept of drawing that big old pistol and pointing it at people, which is a very aggressive act, right? Go ahead, make my day, right? Uh, I don't know, did I fire five shots or did I fire six? Do you feel lucky, punk, you know? That, that kind of imagery that was created in the movies uh, via Clint Eastwood, Back in the day, if you wanted to buy a Smith & Wesson 44 Magnum, you had to go on like a two-year waiting list to get one of those. They had become so popular because 
of the movies and that kind of aggressive responding that was so popularized. And the funny thing is, most people never shot those firearms or shot them once and found them way too powerful and way too uncomfortable to be any fun. So it was, it was hugely uh, ironic in, in that regard. So these are, are some of the folks that helped us to better understand aggression and their work kind of built on the work of each other as time went on. Right? Additional factors affecting aggression, well, excitation transfer, and Zillman came up with this. Arousal experience in one response is transferred to another stimuli. And if we have a bad day and then we get into a road rage incident, someone cuts us off on the way home, our family members better watch the hell out when we get in the door because we're almost primed to respond aggressively. We're aroused. We're kind of in that situation. And our response to potential aggression triggers become sensitized and we're more likely to respond in an aggressive way. All right, Penelope? What are you doing, Electron? All right. And then habituation. We become used to aggression, thus, perceive, uh, thus diminishing its perceived impact. And in former careers, I knew a lot of Vietnam veterans. I was a little young to go to Vietnam. Uh, the draft actually was en ended the year I turned 18 uh, in, in 1975. But I knew a lot of Vietnam vets, and unfortunately, a lot of them had to, you know, kind of engage in the ultimate uh, act of aggression and killing people. And many soldiers that I met reported, you know, feeling really sick having killed someone the first time. But if they were in a position where they, they killed multiple people over a stretch of time, they become somewhat desensitized. The term here we're using is habituated to it. It doesn't have the same effect on them that it did the first time for some people, right? And then cultivation, like we said, the capa capacity of the mass media to construct a social reality that people perceive as true, even if it isn't. So we have these hordes of, of, of Mexican rapists coming up, right, to, to kill us. And, and so the media then advances this narrative, and it causes people to become more aggressive in response to this perceived threat. And, and we talked about that in the previous, that, that anger is to a perceived threat or a perceived insult. So the capacity for the media or a political party or whoever, right, to cultivate this aggression narrative can cause people to aggress more readily. And this is why we have to be very careful about the information we consume and how it might potentially affect us. And we know that aggression is functional. And here's, you know, in this case, the stronger of these... Uh, you know, the stronger these creatures is more likely to have better breeding opportunities. And that should then facilitate a better gene transmission within that species, right? So we see it in the animal world. Now, this is not something that, that we can apply to the human world anymore. And Darwin was pretty damn clear on that with his descent of man argument. So regardless, a little bit about aggression. Uh, thank you for your time and attention. And uh, there's only one more lecture up before we part company. So uh, we'll get to it. Uh, you get to it when you're able. Take care. Right, Penelope?